One day, vast grasslands started to open. Clouds of volcanic gas and ash rose into the sky. Flows of lava streamed down the hills and across the plains. Within minutes, black volcanic glass started to rain from above, wiping out animals, crushing plants. It didn't take long before the land caved in, opening giant pits filled with red-hot magma. Not so long ago, there have been some curious changes in water levels in different parts of Yellowstone Lake. The water level could be rising on one side of the lake and falling on the other at the same time. It looked as if the lake basin was getting lifted by some underground forces. Is it a sign of a looming disaster? Is the Yellowstone supervolcano ready to erupt? Let's figure it out. Geysers, mud pots, and hot springs turn Yellowstone National Park into some extraterrestrial world. And all these wonders are fueled by a mighty supervolcano. Such volcanoes produce super eruptions. When it happens, about 240 cubic miles of ash, molten rock, and hot gases get launched up into the air. In other words, four super eruptions could fill the Grand Canyon to the brim. Supervolcanoes appear when huge volumes of magma are trying to escape from deep underground. Eventually, they burst through the Earth's surface. Sometimes, all this magma gets stuck, unable to break through the planet's crust. And then, massive pools of pressurized magma gather at a depth of several miles. The pressure keeps growing because more and more magma is trying to get to the surface. At one point, a super eruption goes off. The Yellowstone Giant was thought to be responsible for at least three enormous eruptions and countless smaller ones. In that region, the volcanic deposits are scattered over tens of thousands of miles. Scientists believe that they had been created by many weak eruptions. But after doing some more research, experts found out that these deposits could have been left by a previously unknown super eruption that took place about 8.7 million years ago. A year before that event, Yellowstone gave a warning. But that long ago, there was no one who could interpret these signals. Plus, those alarming processes were mostly going on underground. For example, decompression released gas bubbles. While bursting, such bubbles can often power particular kinds of eruptions. Months before the eruption, small-scale earthquakes became more frequent and more intense. The ground in many spots all over the supervolcano got hotter than it used to be. Surface lakes and groundwater also became warmer. If people had been around at that time, they would have noticed unusual steam fogging that area. Experts think it was the greatest eruption of the Yellowstone supervolcano. This giant, which is actually one of the largest active volcanic systems on our planet, wasn't named supervolcano for nothing. There have been at least three other super eruptions in the history of the Yellowstone volcano. They happened 2.1 million, 1.3 million, and 640,000 years ago. They were 6,000, 700, and 2,500 times more powerful than the devastating eruption of Mount St. Helens in Washington state in 1980. The most recent super eruption was dubbed the Lava Creek eruption. It formed the Yellowstone caldera after spewing out 240 cubic miles of rock, dust, and volcanic ash. By the way, if the Yellowstone supervolcano went off with as much power as it had 2.1 million years ago, it would spit out so much boiling lava, it would be enough to fill Sydney Harbor 4,500 times. Scientists believe that the area around the Yellowstone volcano used to face a super eruption every half a million years. But over the last three million years, the hotspot has seen only two super eruptions. It makes scientists believe these catastrophic events are slowing down. But back to the main question. Are we about to face another super eruption in the nearest future? It would be a catastrophic event. A massive column of lava and ash would rise into the air up to a height of over 16 miles. After that, the volcano would keep pumping ash for days on end. Such a mixture of lava, ash, and gas would be immensely hot. Moreover, it would also move around at a speed of 300 miles per hour. The air near the center of the eruption would heat up to 570 degrees Fahrenheit. 
when the ash got into the stratosphere, the temperatures all over the world would drop. In the worst case scenario, the eruption would be very rich in sulfur. And since this substance is an effective sunblocker, the temperatures would get so low that there would be no summer in the world for the next several years. The seasons would change. Agriculture would face serious problems. The disaster would create disruptions in food supplies. The Federal Emergency Management Agency has estimated that the potential damage would make about $3 trillion in the U.S. alone. But the good news is that scientists think that the Yellowstone supervolcano doesn't present any danger at the moment. For an eruption to happen, the magma inside has to be at least 50% molten. With Yellowstone, this number is just 5 to 15%. Which means that the probability of the eruption is 1 in 730,000. This probably is almost the same as the probability of a big asteroid crashing into Earth. Even better, a recent study made the researchers believe the hotspot might be in a state of decline right now, even despite all the unusual activity going on there. Still, there have been tons of discussions about what people could do to prevent the disastrous super eruption from happening. And the most popular and seemingly effective idea was to cool the Yellowstone super volcano down. Unfortunately, there's a catch. The volcano leaks out only 70% of the heat coming from its magma-filled chambers, but the rest of the heat stays inside. As soon as it reaches a particular threshold, the volcano will erupt. If it was possible to extract at least 35% of the Yellowstone volcano's heat, the eruption could be avoided. The cooler the magma is, the thicker and stickier it gets. It stops being so fluid and doesn't try to get to the surface anymore. After considering these facts, NASA scientists came up with a plan. They suggested drilling a six-mile deep well and pumping down cold, pressurized water. The temperature of the water that would get back to the surface would be approximately 662 degrees Fahrenheit. This way, the heat would be gradually extracted from the volcano. And if a geothermal plant was built on the site, it would generate plenty of electric power. It would be very simple to produce, and its price would be very nice. About 10 cents per kilowatt hour. Sounds like a great plan. Are there any drawbacks? Unfortunately, yeah. Let's say you're drilling a well to deliver cold water to the volcano. And then you accidentally hit its magma chamber. In this case, instead of cooling the giant down, you make the top of the magma chamber much more fragile than it used to be and the whole construction will be at risk of collapsing at any moment. And don't forget that this drilling may also release toxic gases. They often accumulate at the top of the reservoir with magma. Or imagine drilling through Earth's crust, getting deeper and deeper. And then, wham, bam, you hit a hypothermal pocket. Uh-oh, get ready for a catastrophe. This can release gases that are likely to cause a series of super powerful blasts in the worst-case scenario, it may even trigger a full-scale volcanic eruption. But the worst thing? The project would last for thousands of years, up to 16,000. The problem is that by using this method, you can't cool the volcano faster than at a rate of 3 feet a year. On top of that, scientists aren't 100% sure that when they finish this project, the volcano will stay cold for at least 100 years. Yellowstone isn't the only supervolcano on Earth. Check out the list. It includes the Long Valley Caldera in California, the Atana Ignimbrite in Chile, Toba in Indonesia, Taupo in New Zealand, and so on. 